I've had a reoccurring nightmare for over 20 years. In this dream, I find an animal, a pet of mine. Sometimes it's an aquarium filled with fish. Other times it's a cage filled with hamsters, guinea pigs, or rabbits. In every situation, I have forgotten about them. They're either starving or dead. Sometimes they've turned to cannibalism, living in their own filth. The great shame and guilt I feel is gut-wrenching. How could I have let this happen? How long have I forgotten about these poor creatures? Am I that neglectful of a person? Every time I have to remind myself that this is just a dream. Every time I remember Kit Kat. My parents divorced when I was nine. It was something all of us kids, my older brothers and sisters, had expected for a long time. I had heard the word divorce floated around for my entire life. A threat spewed from both of their mouths in fights we could hear late at night from our bedrooms. We were all relieved when they finally followed through. Anything threatened for long enough just becomes annoying. The house and the cars and the furniture were easy to divvy up. My dad put up the biggest fight for his old Navy souvenirs from around the world. A couple of whale's teeth from Australia and a pewter goblet set from Spain. My two brothers and two sisters were much older than me, half-siblings from my mom's two previous marriages. They had already moved out by the time the divorce was complete. Divorce for my siblings were old hat. They had gone through it with my mom more than once. But this was baby girl's first divorce. The last sibling, Carol, my sister closest in age, was already 19 and well into her first year of college in New York. There wasn't even that much debate over me. I would stay with my dad while my mom went to nail school in California. But she never finished and my living situation became permanent. Soon after, he was stationed in San Diego. The two of us packed up our cats and drove cross country from Connecticut. My newly single and awkward dad found himself in the position of raising a 12-year-old preteen daughter. We were alone in this move together. I assumed since I was in a new state without any friends, I could just open up to my dad about every little thing I had experienced. Which teachers I liked, what subjects they were teaching, which kids had been mean to me and those I liked. But mostly, I tried to wrap my head around this insane cultural difference between East Coast and West. In California, the girls all wore the tiniest shorts and they acted way older than the sixth graders back in Connecticut. I needed a buddy to talk to, take away the ouchiness from moving, being in a new school and city. Shortly after settling into California, I heard my dad on the phone with my sister Carol, my ears burning. Suzanne keeps talking to me like I'm her friend. I'm her dad, not her friend. Gee, thanks, dad. I felt embarrassed and betrayed. Was I too needy, asking for too much? I thought we, I thought we had each other's backs in this move. He obviously didn't have mine. My one attempt at solace was simple. 12-year-old me demanded a new pet. The cats had lost their charm. They were old and independent and just had that uncool East Coast vibe. <laughs> I needed a pet that was as edgy and as angsty as I felt. <laughs> a new pet would solve everything. Exploring the animal section at the library, I read about a creature that was clean and easy to train, low cost, low maintenance. My dad had forfeited his position to argue with me when he stopped having conversations with me. He passively drove me to the closest pet store. We bought a bag of pine shavings, some pet food, one of those bottle drippy water thingies, and a small black and white male rat. I set up an aquarium in the living room, one we had brought from Connecticut that used to house pet goldfish years and years earlier. My dad made a heavy mesh top to cover it, lest the cats get curious at night. Still being a little kid, I named him after my favorite candy bar and the sound he made scratching and sniffling at night. Kit Kat. Kit Kat the rat. <laughs> and he was perfect. He was everything those pet rat books I had borrowed from the library promised. Rats are cute and underestimated, kind of like preteen girls. He was clean, always licking his paws and rubbing around his head and ears like a cat. That's the best. Eating small carrots using both his little hands. He also did his business in one specific corner of his cage, making cleaning up after him easy. He was super smart and friendly. I could put the palm of my hand at the bottom of his cage and he would climb all the way up to my shoulder 
nuzzling under my hair at the base of my neck. I could take him for walks to our local thrifty for cheap ice cream, and he'd stay right on my shoulder. He loved the front pocket of my hoodie or a long sleeve he could climb through, resting like he was in a hammock under my forearm. Kit Kat was a good little beastie. A good beastie for a new girl in town having a really rough time in life. He was something that needed me to care for it, and he made me feel special and unique. Having a pet rat was extraordinary. My dad didn't mean to be an asshole at the time. He was just emotionally checked out. Or maybe he was always emotionally checked out, and that's why my mom left. Or maybe he was doing the best he could, given his emotionally cold, poor 1950s Midwestern upbringing. <laughs> but at the time, going through middle school in a new state, worlds away from my closest friends, it made me extremely disappointed and angry. My dad is the kind of guy that would never change the batteries out of your toys when they ran out. He'd just either expect that a kid had access to a car and cash and could run out and find a pack of AA batteries and one of those tiny screwdrivers to remove the plate that held them. <laughs> it was not his problem that the batteries ran out. It was the toy owner's problem. But my solution was to ask my dad for help, and he just refused. So these toys got one go around and usually died around February. He also refused to buy games for my Nintendo or CDs for a CD player, even with chores or birthday money. It was just something he refused to do. I think he resented the extra step these things required. Screw that toy that needed batteries or the CD player that needed CDs in order to play music or that daughter that just needed a little communication to adjust. His Norwegian Midwestern bachelor ways were irritated at the extra process. The extra steps required to operate something was not his responsibility. This attitude towards electronics and his daughter extended to Kit Kat the rat. You see, it had been about a year since I adopted Kit Kat when his left eye started swelling. He had those shiny black bead eyes, and one was just a little bit larger than the other. I asked my dad, who had gone to goddamn medical school to become a dentist, if he thought it was strange, if he noticed anything different. Should we take Kit Kat to see a vet? <laughs> you don't take a rat to a vet, he laughed. My dad refused to pay $50 for something he had spent $8 on to buy. And he didn't help me with any other options. But uh, Kit Kat didn't look fine, he just got worse. Over the next few months, Kit Kat's left eye grew to the size of a quarter drying in spots, getting in the way when he would use his little arms to clean his face and his ears. This was a horror show rat. Again, I asked the only adult I had available what my options were. My dad treated this pet like a Casio keyboard that had run out of batteries, not his problem. Nor did he offer me a solution or advice on what I could possibly do to help. I called a vet, my tiny voice asking how much it would be to put down a pet rat. I was told an office visit was about $50 and that should cover it. But at this point I was 12 and that was not something I had lying around. So maybe I could just let the rat out in the wild and maybe he would be taken out of his misery by a quick pluck from a hawk or an owl. Or I could leave the cage open one night and let the cats take care of it. Or maybe I could break his neck if I had to. Uh, morbid solutions ran through my head, but I wasn't old enough, uh, strong enough, tough enough to follow through with any of them. My sister Carol came to visit during this time on vacation from college, 10 years older than me. She was 22 at the time. I picked up Kit Kat and tearfully told her how dad wouldn't help and I didn't know what to do. She shrieked at the sight of him. This soft black sack of an eyeball hung off the side of his head. <laughs> the only thing she told me was, I am so ashamed of you. How could you let this happen? I can still feel that burning feeling behind my eyes. My, ta my jaw tightens. How can you be ashamed of a 12-year-old? What power did I have? Carol left back to New York without a solution, leaving me alone again. And whatever caused Kit Kat's eye to go all explodey was what eventually killed him. Cancer? Who knows? I didn't go to medical school, nor was I even an adult. <laughs> the walks around the block, on my neck, under my hair stopped. So did the cuddling in the pouch of my hoodie. But Kit Kat was around for a good six months with that creepy eyeball. 
I still took him out of his cage and scrubbed it down, filled up his food dish, gave him treats, made sure he had fresh water out of that little drippy bottle thingy that hung in the corner, and he just died, a rat in a cage. The morning Kit Kat died, I told my dad, and he picked him up by the tail and took him outside, buried him in the backyard. I emptied his cage and put it in the garage. I never asked my dad for another pet. Adults should be there to help with the big stuff, our food and our shelter, but they also need to help with the other big stuff, the care, the love, the lessons of inhumanity, empathy, and responsibility. And those dreams I have of guilt and neglect all come from those last six months with that last childhood pet. Little Kit Kat and I, wrapped in the same loop, stuck in the same cage of neglect. Thank you. That was Suzanne.